So welcome everyone. My name is Grzegorz Piwowarek. Um, here's my Twitter handle, and I'm really glad that I can see you here. This feels a bit weird after after so many years of doing only online events, uh, but luckily I am still here. Um, I went a bit out of practice, but hopefully everything's gonna be okay. So today we'll be speaking most. Um, before we, I'll tell you. Um, uh, I'm a lead architect in a Hazelcast. That means that I work at the CTO office and I kind of oversee a few different projects, but mostly been working ex almost exclusively with the cloud, new cloud product as well as the next generation of Hazelcast. Uh, you can find me all around the place doing workshops and see some of my blog posts on my, on my blog. It's been effectively dead for a couple of months, but I'm going back to it. So. Um, I'm an architect, so as you know, I don't probably code that much. So I hope I will be able to prove you that architects can still code. However, I can't promise you that this would work because I haven't coded in la in, uh, never in my life before. But before we get into the actual topic of asynchronicity and computer future, I need to do something because I lost a bet yesterday during the party. Okay, thank you. So, going back to the topic of today. Before we go right into the comfortable future itself, let's do a very quick uh, overview of the differences between asynchronicity, synchronicity, and what's wrong with the original future in Java. So, synchronicity is kind of the default setup for all of us. It's how we do things. If we have two operations that are synchronous, that means that we need to synchronize them somehow. So if we have operation A and operation B, and we want to uh, have them working synchronously, it means that operation B will need to wait for the operation A to start to, uh, to be able to continue. And that's kind of the default setup. If you write two lines of code, by default, that's what happens. You do the first operation, you wait for the result. When it ends, you proceed to the next one. However, that's not always, the, not always the optimal setup, because sometimes we might want to leverage parallelism. We want to do things in parallel and not wait. Um, if we are able to do stuff in parallel and not wait for the, operation to, for the first operation to complete, we can do stuff much faster. So this is where asynchronicity comes into play. In the asynchronous setup, we don't have operations waiting on each other, but we start the A operation, and operation B goes somewhere on the side and completes somewhere in the background. But here comes the first problem, because if you have the two operations that don't synchronize, how do you pro process the results? Because, well, it's not the point of just having operations parallel. You probably just w you want to be able to do something with them. So if I, let's say, imagine I'm implementing uh, some form of stock exchange and I need, or forex exchange, and I need to, let's say I'm doing operations in parallel to be able to fetch, for example, currency exchange data and wait only for the one that, that comes, the, fir the, the first one that comes. And I need to be able to receive the result, right? So if I just, if something that, I throw it to the side and wait for it to come back, um, that doesn't really work. We need to somehow receive that result. And this is where the, the future comes into play. So the concept of the future is effectively a, a spawn point for, for results of asynchronous operations. So imagine we have a simple piece of code. Well, imagine like um, return 42. Obviously, that, that's synchronous, we just return it. But if you would like this operation, that very complex operation of returning 32, make it asynchronous and wait for it to return, we'd probably have some form of executor service. Let's say we've just one thread. We would submit the operation of returning 32 into it. And now, we get a future. 
which means that this is a container, and at some point in the future, no pun intended, this 42 will materialize exactly in that particular spot. So at some point, if I want to wait for it, I can do it explicitly using dot, dot .get. But as you can see, there are a few kind of problems with that. So first things first, the implementation looks kind of ugly because it forces you to um, it forces you to process to the interrupted exception and exa execution exception, which is quite ugly. And if you look at the whole API, we have just a few method. we have methods. We have get, cancel, is done, is canceled. And they are all blocking. So where is the value in, in that? So I submitted the operation of returning 32. I called dot get, and I blocked and wait for that. So as you can see, this, this, sound, this looks kind of shady, because the point of asynchrony is that I don't need to block and wait. Well, it still can be beneficial, because let's say if I start another operation here that's kind of lengthy, I can have them effectively running in parallel. But in quite many cases, I like to avoid explicit blocking and waiting for the result. What if I just want to print it out? Wouldn't it be easier if I could say declaratively, OK, when the value arrives, just print it out, instead of blocking the main thread? And that's effectively what Comptable Future allows us to do. It tackles the problems of uh, standard future, um, which you've just seen. And the problem is that, um, I mean, this was introduced in JDK 1.8. I 1.5, sorry. Um, and we haven't really had any better option. We've Normally, before JDK 8, we would kind of default to listenable future from Guava or something else homebrewed. This was a bit better because you could register callbacks, which would be pretty handy. So you could just say explicitly on the future, add listener um, and do something with the value that arrives, which is slightly better. But before JDK 8 and no Lambda expressions, we would need to use anonymous inner classes, uh, which was, let's be honest, pretty, pretty ugly to use. And here comes the JDK 8 and Comptable Future, the new powerful future that allows you to do way more than that. So the main difference between the normal future and the Comptable Future is that it, it's even written in the name, completable, which means the future can be completed. So if I create a, um, a, a raw Comptable Future of an object, I can manually complete it with a particular value. In the past, it wasn't really possible. There was You couldn't really get a raw future value. It was one of the implementations returned by executor service and was always tied directly into an executing thread. In here, it's more like a container that can be, that can be supplied with a value from arbitrary number of sources. And this is a huge improvement because um, suddenly, it's possible to write declarative code. So instead of wondering how to chain, how to, how to block, or how, or how to work around some limitations of the future, you got this beautiful, nice declarative API. So you can say, instead of doing what I showed you, you say, then apply, then combine, then run, and provide Lambda expressions. And this style of programming is very easy to use once you get accustomed to, the, to this, this programming model. Because essentially what you tell is you, you tell the future what needs to be done and you don't spend time on uh, wondering how to implement something. So for example, if you need, imagine you start, a few, uh, you start a few operations in parallel and you want to wait for the first one to complete, how would you do this with normal futures? You would need to probably introduce some form of a blocking queue. Uh, you would need to pass this blocking queue to the some utility that schedules those operations and make sure that inside those asynchronous operations, at the end of the operation, the result is put in a queue, then outside of those operations, you need to block on that queue and wait. You see, this is, this is doable, but that's a lot of extra complexity that you don't really need to worry when you use declarative style of programming, because you say, I want this, I want that, and that's pretty much it. But this talk is not about basics of Comptable Future. 
if you want to learn the basics and how all the methods look like, there is a great talk by Java champion Tomasz Nurkiewicz, and I, this one is highly recommended. Uh, in this talk, we are focusing on the parts that are quite often omitted, which are absolutely crucial to be successful, or at least not be an absolute failure on production with uh, compatible futures itself. Because unfortunately, the tool, tool is great, uh, but it has a few unintuitive solutions, or just by due its nature, it features some surprising elements, and that's what I would like to tell you about today. And the first one that we'd like to cover is how to cancel the damn future. So if we go back to the original futures, so if you go for executive service, we submit something there, return 42, Let's say it's a very lengthy operation. Just, just imagine that it is. Um, so, and we can do just cancel and pass true here. Which means that um, if we pass the true to the main interrupt if running flag, it means the underlying thread will be interrupted. And interruptions for threads are just a graceful mechanism for telling, informing the thread to please shut down when it's convenient for you. And that's, that's reasonable, right? So. If we go suddenly from this to a comfortable future, which, by the way, we schedule this way, supply async, return 42 on executed service. Let's call it submit as well. Right? Looks the same. Because guess what? Comfortable future internally, it also implements a future interface. So what could potentially go wrong here? So let's have a look at the cancel operation and the documentation. And there's this note that may interrupt if running flag, this value has no effect in this implementation because interrupts are not used to control processing. Okay, the first surprise. Interruptions don't work. But how come they don't work if I can clearly cancel the future? So if I cancel the future, um, cancel and then try to obtain the value. Let's let's try to run it. It's clearly cancelled. Okay, there's cancellation exception. So so what's happening here? It's it looks like it works, right? But they tell me it doesn't work. Um, so the difference is that a few minutes ago I told you that Contable Future is just a container which can be completed with a value, and this generates actual problems when you start thinking about stuff like cancellations. Imagine you have this, um, this chain of operations. You have then apply, then combine, then run. In order for this to be chainable, each of the steps returns a new comfortable future. And each of those futures can be completed from multiple threads. So the question is, if I cancel that the last one in the chain, what do I actually cancel? Do I cancel the operation that's re re represented by that future returned by that run? OK, but this operation doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's actually a chain of, it's a result of the chaining with the operation caused by, created by the then combine, which is caused by the result of then apply, and so on and so on. So this is actually a very complex, uh, complex process, because there is no one-to-one -one mapping between a future and a thread which we had in the past with standard futures. Um, and the answer to this, there is, this is difficult. There is nothing we can really do to cancel underlying thread, and if we don't want to do any form of extra hacking. That's something we need to be ready for when we are working with comfortable futures. So you can work it around. If you know that if you are controlling both sides of the future, if you are controlling the part that's submitting a future and receiving a future, if you really want that, you can actually hack it. You can, for example, create your own future and introduce this one-to-one -one mapping with an underlying thread. But this is very specific and generally not advised. So this is only for the situations where you know what you are doing. But in most cases, you just want to remember that comfortable futures won't give you these handy cancellations you would expect from standard futures. 
And it's quite often a problem. If you try Googling, if you go over to Stack Overflow, you will see why my people are asking questions. Why is my operation not canceled? Because the future doesn't know all the threads that could potentially um, complete that particular future that you are working with. Um, so this is the first part that you need to be aware. Unfortunately, I, there is no really good solution to that. It's mostly about awareness building. But here comes the more interesting one that happens way more often. An act of combining multiple futures together. Um, and this might sound like an, like an easy job. So let's go here again. So we have this computable future, supply async. Let me do some static imports to make it fit on the screen. So th this will be called Contable Future 1. This will be Contable Future 2. We throw it away. OK, and a simple job. We want to wait for the results of all the futures. We want to wait for them, for them to complete. And there is this very handy method if you start looking around. All of. Sounds reasonable, OK? What would you expect the Contable Future all of to do? Um, you pass two futures, and you probably get some form of combined future to be returned. So let's make it combined. And here's usually where the first surprise strikes everyone. It, for some reason, returns a void. OK, weird, but I will allow it. So come to our future all of. We pass multiple futures to one method. We wait for all of them to complete. And naturally, intuitively, I would expect the, f the, the combined future to have all the results of the future that completed, right? Um, but it doesn't. It returns a void. But it's not the last surprise that's awaiting you. Because if you look right around here, you see this all of method. It actually accepts multiple futures as var args, which is OK. But as you can see in those generics here, it has a question mark, which means it accepts futures of various types. Which means that if I have one computable future of integer and future of string here, suddenly it's OK. So I can pass multiple futures of various types. So if I have a computable future holding an integer, computable future holding a string, computable future holding a car, or whatever else, this will all work. The compiler will say, OK, it's OK and still not giving a result. So this is not that useful, because I can hardly think of any real life scenario where I would like to uh, wait for futures of different types. So, but I can live with that if I really want to. But there is one more interesting thing. So let's actually expand that one a bit. Let's add some artificial delay. Let's say that we are waiting one second. Please forgive me for ignoring those interruptions in such an ugly way. Um, now we go, we take the same piece of code, take it here, we'll introduce more delays. Let's say, let's say five seconds, and it returns to, but as a string. So combined, we have the combined future, let's block on it and wait for the result. So if I run it, you can expect that, well, we have two operations running in parallel. Wait, actually not in parallel because we have a thread pool only with uh, one thread, which means that what would wait, they would just execute one by one. Um, so as you can expect, this will probably run for around five seconds. Since we have, we have two operations starting at the same time, um, first one completes after one second, second one completes after five seconds. Um, in this case, you see it running because I, I forgot to shut down the executor service because the JVM won't stop, won't, comp uh, won't really stop if there are uh, still non-daemon threads running. And we have some threads running in this thread pool. So let's actually shut it down, run it again, and you will see that after five seconds, the whole operation stops. OK, but if you are waiting for all of the results of all of those um, features, what happens if we actually throw an exception earlier? So let's say we have, we're waiting for 10 operations, most of them, and you know, some of them last, for example, minutes. But what if one of them just throws an exception in the middle of the processing? 
right? In most cases, we would like this, we would like this exception to be propagated further, right, immediately, so that we don't need to wait, you know, a couple of minutes for the operation that's, that's doomed to fail anyway. So let's see what happens. So we have this five seconds here, one second here. We get rid of that and say, instead of returning one, just throw new illegal argument exception right away. So we have two futures. One of them completes immediately with an exception because they're, 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 we are simulating failures. And the second one, which lasts five seconds. So let's see what's happening. And that's another surprising part. This all of method is actually waiting for the, all the operations to complete. As the name suggests, all of, it's waiting for the completion. It doesn't matter if it's an, an, a, a completion with a result or it's an exceptional <coughs> completion, it will wait for all of them to complete. And now this suddenly starts to make sense because all of that accepts method, uh, computer futures of various types, where you wait for all of them to complete, it makes a bit more sense uh, than waiting for the, uh, uh, than returning void and waiting uh, and, and accepting the same of the same, uh, all features of the same type. Uh, but this is still a rather niche use case. That's in most cases, I'd like to wait for all the futures to complete and uh, just get my results. And if I know that all my future, I can't get my results, just just fail the future and let me move on. Decide to do what to do next. Um, so this is, as you can see, quite an interesting case. Um, and let's quickly try to fix it, how we would like this to look like. So we could, for example, borrow that method all over here, all off. Um, let's return null for now. So how we'd like to fix it? Probably we'd like to enforce all the futures to be of the same type. Um, so this, for example, we'd like to return the list of t's um, that T needs to go here. Um, there's the control future here, and okay, this looks like a slightly better method. So if you'd like to fix it by yourself, luckily we are able to reuse what we have right here. We are able to reuse this method, but we would need to tweak it a bit. So in order for this to work, um, actually I think it would make a bit more sense if we have a list of computable futures. So first things first, we need to figure out how to pass the var args or array into that method. And this is, this is um, maybe not super intuitive, but doable. So you need to do it like, like that. And that's the combined future we've already had uh, a few steps earlier. Fun fact, if you are converting an array, a list into an array, always remember to pass a zero here and not the size of, an array, of, of the original list. Um, there is a nice blog post from Shipilev about that where he pretty much goes for, this explains it in 60 pages of assembly code. But the thing is that um, if you pass the number of the, the, the original collection size, JVM will waste, waste some time on zeroing all those elements. If you start with an empty, if it's zero array, this step will never happen, and this gets faster. OK, so we have this combined future. Um, so now we need to figure out how to convert this into a, a list of, uh, of results. So actually, that, that method, all of, is actually pretty good. Um, if you look inside, at the, it's pretty smart. It constructs a nice big tree of completions, so the signals are propagated in an optimal way. So I don't want to write this by myself. It doesn't make sense. I want to reuse it. So if I know that this combined future actually finished with all the, all the futures, we can, we can play a trick on it. So we can say, then apply, and totally ignore the result it has. And it has a void inside, right? But once this then apply is run, we already know that the future has completed. So we can just go and totally ignore it and go back to our original list, because why not? And now it's safe to iterate through all the, for, from, uh, iterate, iterate through all the original features because we know they are already completed and dot join doesn't really block. And once we have it, you already have come to a future with a list of T. 
and that's something you can direct return. But that's not all. So we could get rid of that, run it, and it already works. Uh, let's just make it a list uh, of those two. What you don't, what's going on here? Okay, this doesn't match, so let's make it list of integer. This needs to be an integer. It works. So if you run it, you will see that this actually executes correctly, um, but we still don't get this short circuiting we cared about. And here comes the magical step that we need to add here, which means we need to iterate over the original collection of futures and say, uh, and, and say, um, if you, uh, when, not CF, CF when complete, if you complete with throwable, that's non-null, then complete the original feature with, uh, with that throwable. What we are introducing here effectively is a race. So we have this original feature, and we say, okay, if one of those features completed exceptionally, complete it immediately. And this introduces this desired behavior that we want. As you can see now, it failed immediately without waiting for the second operation to complete. Um, and, but luckily, that's not something you, it's, it's good to be aware of, that th that's kind of the way you work with contable futures, but in most cases, you don't need to, if you already know what you are looking for, you'll pretty very quickly get, to find those results online. So that's, there's rarely a case that you need to do that, write it by yourself. And for example, here's the code of for taking from one of the popular open source testing frameworks. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty sophisticated piece of uh, computer future code, but look what's happening in the end. At the end, there's this computer future all of call right here, which actually makes the same problems. So imagine you have a few multiple containers, Docker containers are starting at the same time, and one of them fails immediately, and you know that, uh, and you know that uh, your testing environment will never be ready, but you still are pulling and waiting for other containers to start only to fail the whole operation. So as you can see, this is, this is quite a common problem. Another issue is the computer future any of, which kind of acts in a bit similar way, um, because wh what could go wrong? So we have those two operations, CF1, CF2, and instead of all of, we go for any of. And any of is also broken in some way. Uh, any of. Let me just unwrap that list. Uh, any, let's call it any. So, it's the same situation. We have two futures, and we want to wait for any of them. So, what's your expectation? Let's say you're running two parallel calls to two services, um, and you're calling any of. How do you expect it to return the first one that completed with an actual value? And that's, this is how it works if you have, if all of the operations complete successfully. But guess what? Look, we have one future that completes with exception and one that waits five seconds. So in such case, I would expect that future to wait for five seconds to give me the actual result. But whoa, a surprise. The way the any of works is that it returns any that completed first. So that's totally not what I would expect from a tool like that. Um, and it's quite surprising, um, but if you understand how the future works internally, it's not that much of a surprise. Um, so again, I know that there are use cases for that, uh, but I'm truly missing the, the most obvious one, where I want to wait for the first successful completion. Um, so unfortunately, you need to write it by yourself. It's also a bit, it's a bit tricky. Um, again, I'm not expecting you to write it all the time, but if you are aware that this problem exists, you'll pretty quickly find it, uh, find it online. And here we arrive at the most interesting part of, uh, of today's session. Computer future versus threading. Because, well, that's a, that's a deep and interesting topic. So, as we've spoken already, um, 
With, JD, with standard feature from Java Util Concurrent in JDK 1.5, that was really easy. You had one feature bound to one particular thread. So if you cancel, there are no, no problems, nothing else. You couldn't train operations. Um, it didn't, you, you wouldn't have all those dilemma you have with countable futures. But now, here comes an interesting part. So you have this countable future. You call run async. You call then run, then run. And the first question is, what thread does it actually execute on? In the past, it was very easy, because with the original futures, what you would do is you would just go for you would just go for e submit runnable, and you know that you could expect this to be executed on the executor service e. But in that code that I just wrote, I conveniently skipped some things. I'm not sure if you noticed. Let's try to do it again. Come to the future, supply async, return 42. Let's call it result. Let's call it result join. So there is some result. Let's print it out. And shut down the original executor service just in case. And as you can see, it clearly executes somewhere, right? But there is this method which accepts just a, just a, a, lambda, a lambda parameter. Where does it execute? We didn't provide any executor service. So where does it execute? In the cloud or what? Um, so the answer is, let's see, by ourselves. So we can expand that, go for current thread uh, get name, and try to print it out. Return to. And let's see what's happening. Oh, so here's the answer. It's executing on a fork join pool common thread worker thread number nine. And the common pool is a very interesting one. It's a very one you can be very careful with. And we'll get to this in a second. But here, so we already established where it executes by default. But here comes another problem. So imagine we do this run async and, pr and it executes on the uh, main pool. We can overwrite it. And that's actually the way to do it. We can just say run it on the executor of my choice. There's another parameter for that. And as you can see, it executes on the thread pool of my choice. As you can see, the naming pattern is different. But here comes the, another problem, philosophical problem. So there's this run async. We execute on a given pool. But then there's then run. What pool, what thread will this execute on? And you might be thinking, OK, well, let's do it on the same thread that executed the first stage. Sounds reasonable, right? But here comes the problem. What if the original thread co finished the work at this stage before this even was called? OK, because it's clearly possible, right? We get a future, we call then run, but the original thread did its job, and it's doing some other job. So it sounds like another problem to solve, because if we would like to reuse the same thread, we would need to keep another queue of operations for it. And well, if it's busy doing something else, when does it come back? And if it's not busy, how do, where does it execute? Let's see. Let's see what, what actually is going on, because it's also quite interesting. So we have this operation executing on the executor of our choice. So let's go for the, let's give it actually some artificial delay here again. Let's give it one second of a delay. Please, for, please forgive me for this um, interruption handling. Let's go as an run. And here we'll just print out the thread name again. Um, we'll get rid of that result because we don't need it anymore. I will draw in right here. So, and, well, it executed twice the same thread. Makes sense, right? Because we, the first thread is executing the first stage, then it sees that it needs to execute another stage, and it performs it as well. Perfect, that's how it's supposed to be. So let's make it a bit more complex now. So let's remove that artificial delay over here. And let's run it a few times. Oh, it did, it, I didn't expect it to work in the first time. I expected to try it at least five times, but... 
So look, what happened here? We called supply async. It was executed on the thread from, the, from, this, from this thread pool. But then it completed almost immediately, and the thread went away to do its job somewhere else. And look what happened. It was the main thread that actually executed that job here. The main thread, which is the thread executing this method here, which means we ended up with fully blocking semantics despite the fact that, we that there is a compatible future here. It sounds like it's always supposed to execute asynchronously, but what we did, we blocked the main thread. It was supposed to be non-blocking, but it's blocking. And you can see, this is not a big issue here, uh, because let's say that's another very lengthy operation. But what if we are running a very lengthy operation here? Let's run it again. Look. Now, the main thread is blocked for 10 seconds to execute this stage, which tricked you into thinking that it's fully asynchronous. Well, it's not asynchronous, effectively, because it's running on the main thread. And that's something very important to be aware of. And the, the reason they chose to go forward with this way is that it's not an easy, there is no easy answer to that. So if there are those, this, the operations are chained and you end up with the last operation and there is no thread to execute it on, perhaps the caller thread is one of the best candidates to do so. But uh, if we really want to enforce asynchronicity, you need to remember about this magical word. All those computer future methods, they feature another special word, uh, the postfix to their name. There's always the then run and then run async. There is then apply, then apply async, and so on. So if you want to make sure that this is 100% asynchronous, you need to add that word here. So if you run it, if we run it right now, you will see that the first stage executed on the thread pool of our choice, when the second one executed, oh, wait, 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 what? It executed on the common pool worker. Why is so? All ah, right, because it's the same convention. If you don't pass the executor service explicitly, it executes on the forging pool. And I will tell you soon why is it a very bad idea. So if you want to be 100% sure that you're executing asynchronously on the thread pool of your choice, you always need to pass that parameter at the very end. And it's only now that we are fully asynchronous and we are fully controlling the flow. So as you can see, the first stage executed on the thread one, thread one completed its job, then the thread two took over from the same pool. And that's perfectly okay, that's, actually that, 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 that's how it should work. So as you can see, all good here. But the problem is that com com um, common pool is a very interesting thread pool. So, um, it's been designed in a slightly different way. The normal way the thread pools are uh, built, I have a... F normal pools are built in such a way that there are, well, there are threads in a pool. In front of the pool there is a queue which is accepting um, a tasks that threads are taking from that, pool, uh, from that queue. But if there are many producers putting stuff to this queue and many threads trying to read from that queue, you end up with a lot of contention, and you end up wasting quite a lot of time blocking or just waiting on trying to synchronize uh, queue operations. So that multi-producer, multi-consumer queue is, doesn't operate that well if you have a lot of consumers and producers at the same time. Co uh, common pool, uh, forgering pool, tried to tackle that issue by giving a separate queue to each of the, to each of the threads. But what's more? It's that the common one is the one that's shared for the whole, all the uh, utilities in your JVM. So if you go over to fork join pool, there's this common pool, which returns just this shared fork join pool instance. And there is a very good reason for that, because it's supposed to work great with CPU-bound tasks. So you'll see often that that fork join pool is actually instantiated uh, with the number of threads, which is more or less correlated to the number of um, CPUs you have on your machine. It doesn't need to be a number of physical machines, but something that's returned by, but the number is actually returned by uh, get runtime um, and avail available processors. And 
this is not always the number of actual CPUs. Um, some CPUs can trick you into thinking that they have more than they actually have. It's called hyperthreading. Um, but more or less it is. So the reason is there's one, because if you want to execute a CPU-intensive task, it doesn't make sense to have more workers than you have CPUs on your system. Because if you start adding more, because, well, that's as much as you have, right? Four CPUs. If you execute eight operations in parallel on four CPUs, it won't get suddenly faster. It will be still executed by those four CPUs. But you will spend, waste a lot of time switching between them to give you that illusion of parallel execution. So here comes the problem. If you want this to work nicely and properly, you need to throw only CPU-intensive tasks at it. You know, you want to do you know, some array processing, sorting, uh, similar stuff. But if you are doing network calls, if you are fetching DB, if you are using logs and blocking, you are wasting time of those precious threads in this shared pool uh, for effectively doing nothing. Because if you're waiting for an I.O. operation, you are doing nothing. You are just waiting for it. Same with any form of database calls, logs, and, and so on. And it, it can heavily impact your system on production if you do that, because suddenly your thread pool is busy doing nothing while you should be doing CPU-intensive jobs. And that's actually not all, um, because the common threading pool is used by parallel streams. So if you, there is no actual way to use streams, parallel streams, with the thread pool of your choice. Um, it by default executes on the threading pool. So guess what? If you have your, so your, for, uh, your parallel streams can be impacted by stuff that you throw, that you use, uh, that you execute with single comfortable futures using default executors. Uh, guess what? Maybe you are doing everything correct. Maybe you are doing as it, as it should be. Um, but you are running on some application server, which is one shared JVM, but the team next to you that's deploying a var application on top of that is doing something shady with fork joint pools and, and, their, and their tools. Well, you see this is one JVM with one pool in, in, in the center of it. They can potentially impact your application. Um, what's more, have you heard about Project Loom? Virtual threads, you can create thousands of them, right? Tens of thousands, millions. Nice, right? But at the end of the day, they need to be executed somewhere. And do you know where they're ex executed by default? Guess what? On the fork joint pool. And it makes sense, right? Uh, but if you, you need to pay special attention to that pool. If you, if you throw some garbage, I mean, by garbage, I mean blocking corporations at it, the performance will degrade. So once the loom comes out, we will probably be getting way more problems like this one. Um, by the way, and just for the, for the sake of it, I actually created a, a library that's actually solving those issues. It's called Parallel Collectors. So if you really want to use your own custom, uh, your own custom uh, thread pools on the Parallel Streams, there is a tool for that. But this talk is about something else. So, but that's not the end of the surprises. So if you actually, if we dig into the code of Computable Future, actually I say that in the slides, you will see that uh, there is this flag here. Use common pool. So if you figure out that if the computer futures identifies that you're, you, are run, you, are, you are running on a computer with one CPU, they will actually not use the forgery pool. They will use a thread per task executor. And what is that? A thread per, um, I lost it. Let me just show it here. And thread per task executor is a very interesting implementation of the executor service that it's not a thread pool, actually. It just creates a new thread each time. And you might be thinking. And it actually makes sense, because if you have just one CPU, you probably won't, you won't like to avoid potential deadlocks caused by having to manage just one, one thread. So it kind of makes sense to just, just in case, create more threads to do that, because having some resource waste is better than having a deadlock. And you might be thinking now. Um, Gregor, but you know, we are, it's 2022, my machine doesn't have one core, it's more like to have 128 cores than one core. What are you, uh, how come your computer has just only one CPU? Why would you worry about that? Guess what? Because we are living in the world of containers, 
Kubernetes, where we quite often use um, control groups to and to artificially, logically restrict the number of resources allocated to a particular container. And that's a quite a common issue. So if you're running on containers, Kubernetes in the cloud, don't be surprised that actually your machine acts like it has just one CPU. And this is the place where a funny things can start happening. Um, this I told you already. So the point is always remember to provide your executor, uh, executor service to your control futures whenever you uh, actually care about asynchrony. If you're running some very basic operations, if like you receive an integer array and want to increment it, don't bother. It's okay to run it without that async postfix. It will work just fine if the main thread executes it. But if those are blocking operations, I'll double think what, what to do with that. And one last thing I'd like to show you today is apply to either versus exceptions. So um, let's, let's get rid of that. So apply to either is another very easy way to apply the uh, function uh, declaratively to the result of a comfortable future. So let's click into that. Supply async. Let's return one on the executor E. That's a CF1. Let's create CF2. And we do quickly apply to either CF1 or CF2 and apply a function that does just nothing, that just returns a value. Let's join and try to wait for the result. And it makes sense. So we say declaratively, apply this function to the well, any of those that compete first. So we can switch the order from one to two, and you will see that it actually works as, as expected. But guess what? Let's introduce an exception here. Let's say legal argument exception. Uh, I forgot I need to use those here. And again, it works as expected, right? Because you have two control features. You are calling apply to either. One of them is throwing exceptions. So as expected, here the result is one of the first one that completes first. OK. Do you see what I'm trying to do now? Let's switch the order now. So the first future throws an exception, and the second one returns one. So what would you expect to work? If you call apply to either, I would expect this to print out number one, just like it did before, right? Because that one failed. So we are waiting for the first one to complete with an actual value. So let's, let's run it. And we have an exception. So apply to either didn't really apply applied to either. It actually propagated the exception further, which is a bit unintuitive if you, if you ask me. So that's one last thing I would like you to be aware of when working with Condo Futures. Whenever the first future completed exceptionally, this exception will propagate further. So don't fall for the illusion that API gives you that it will apply to either. No. If the first one had an exception, it permanently turns into this exceptional and starts propagating exceptions like, like crazy till the end of the whole chain. And that's pretty much all that I wanted to show you today. So um, if you want to find the uh, slides, everything is in the slide, by the way. This was just, just a backup. So, but, so you can read it, find it immediately over there. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, here it is. Um, I work at Hazelcast, so if you'd like to see how the next generation of in-memory computing looks like, try us as well. So I hope you enjoyed it, you learned something new. Thank you, and let's see if you have any questions. So there is a question. Uh, what's your opinion on Twitter's Finagol futures? Um, I've never been there inside deep enough to tell you if it's uh, to give you a very like valid comparison. So I can't really answer this one. I would say, uh, by the way, the conductor is not a bad tool. It's still a very good tool. It's just in order to be successful, you need to be aware of what I just told you. So if you know this already, you're quite likely to be pretty happy and successful. The tool is the tool is really good. 
Um, if, you, if it's not enough for you, you probably should start looking into Project Reactor and stuff like that, where you get full power, where you can fully, truly combine asynchronous streams together. Um, but for the basic use case, basic you know, asynchronicity, that's pretty much all you, that, you, that you need. So personally, I, I stick to, to, to comfortable futures most of the time. Let me check if there are any other questions. I think not. So if there are no questions for the audience, thank you again, and see you hopefully next year. <laughs>